Hey, I'm Christian Chiller, and in this video, I want to look at how you can combine programming and creative writing to interactive fiction and cover a little bit of the past, how we got to where we are now, the tools available now, and the kind of games, fiction, whatever you want to call it, the experiences, the stories people are creating now. So, the adventure begins. Let's begin with history. Interactive fiction actually has its origins in a couple of different places. First, there's books. Books? Yes, books, because books can be interactive too. Back in about 1979, up until the late 90s, the books that kind of define the idea in the first place, at least formally, are the Choose Your Own Adventure books. So much to the point where that has kind of become the description of a whole genre, where actually it was a brand name, and that has caused some problems in the past. These were started by Edward Packard, and you can see here one of the first releases in that series, and they have been re-released many times. They were mostly aimed at children and young readers, relatively limited interactivity you know i think you might know this this what do you want to do go to page 10 go to page 20 that sort of thing so just some simple decisions generally in kind of high fantasy sci-fi westerns those sorts of things after that in the early 80s up until about the middle 90s you have the fighting fantasy books created by Steve Jackson and Ian Livingston. Confusingly, there are actually two Steve Jacksons in the gaming, and it's not the other one. It's a different one. Both of these writers were fairly prolific, even up until now. Ian Livingston also went on to form Games Workshop, which is a pretty well-known games company in the UK. And the fighting fantasy books were a little bit more advanced, had some combat, some magic systems and covered a whole variety of worlds and settings aimed at slightly older readers, but still relatively straightforward. Then one of my personal favorites, again beginning in the mid-80s until the mid-90s, the Lone Wolf series of books by Joe Diva, who I actually sadly discovered died not so long ago. But his books have been re-released and have been re-released and repackaged many times in different ways and different experiences, some of which we'll cover later. These books were different because the first two, The Choose Your Own Adventure and The Fighting Fantasy, were often uh, one-off books, whereas the Lone Wolf books could be one-off, but they also continued. You could actually level up between books and the characters and the complexity of the books developed over time. And I think from memory, there were different sort of sub-series within the series aimed at different ages. And also seemed to have a memory that at a certain point, there was almost like a, a spin-off series with a... I kind of always thought of Lone Wolf as a sort of like a, a ranger type character, if you want to think into fantasy tropes. And then the spin-off books from memory had a, had a kind of a mage or a wizard. Uh, and I loved these books. Um, actually, in doing research for this, I discovered that there was a whole bunch of new releases in the world. And I'm going to go and dig in later because I used to love these when I was younger. Not strictly interactive fiction, but kind of, are text-based computer games. These are actually the first computer games, effectively. Again, you might know these tropes, the you wake up in a dark room, what do you want to do, and you typed in commands, trying to get the interpreter to understand what on earth you meant, and trying to understand what it wanted you to say, and generally getting quite frustrated, but some of these are legendary. So some of the classics are Adventure. Adventure is almost the first computer game and is somewhat responsible for creating networked machines. And I do remember reading a book recently about the history of the internet where the demand on resources for people trying to play Adventure on the early ARPANET, the, the precursor to the internet, was so much that it was actually almost the, the biggest uh, scaling factor of ARPANET. So you could in some respects, say the modern internet is we have it thanks to a computer game. <laughs> then there are others like Zork and Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Some of these you can now play in emulators and uh, be amazed by how hard they often were to play. Behind the scenes were generally very large text trees with some kind of interpreter of natural language. Some of these were written in common programming languages or common at the time. Some were written in their own programming languages. 
For example, Zork was written in Zill, Zork implementation language. And many of the others used something called Inform, which is actually still going in some shape or form. And I'll come to that later. Others were Tads, which is long gone, and Adrift, which isn't going anymore, but I could find releases from about 10 years ago. So it was going until relatively recently. Other games that are somewhat similar to this and bring us more into the modern era of games are Monkey Island and Day of the Tentacle. Still have these kind of big text trees, but instead of trying to get it to understand you, you generally had options. You were clicked and some basic graphics. And some of these games are remembered very fondly by people of a certain age. And they have also been re-released, especially Monkey Island. Believe it or not, there was interactivity added to other media. Some of you, if you've been from particular parts of the world, and I do remember it, may remember a video, and I don't mean a computer, I mean an actual VHS game called Atmosphere, where you had a board and you had to click keys, and this person who looked a bit like the Emperor from Star Wars shouted at you for not getting things right, and yes, you fast-forwarded and rewound the video. They did re-release it on DVD, but I think by that point, computer games had sort of caught up massively and were far more compelling. And again, doing research for this, I did find there was an app version, which kind of works, but I think it's mostly just nostalgia only. The whole video CD craze, which never really got anywhere outside of certain parts of the world, also had some interactive movies, like, for example, this Night Trap game on Sega CD, which I don't ever remember seeing, and video CD died quite quickly. Interactive fiction is not something necessarily confined to the past. In fact, I would argue it's more popular than ever if you look. Telltale games are perhaps one of the best known modern examples. They are effectively now part of a larger company, and I'm not completely sure if they're still releasing things, but they lasted some time, and they released a lot of sort of interactive fiction games in a similar vein to Monkey Island, generally with licensed tie-ins, so from... Uh, films from TV series from comics you probably know quite well and as you can see you have these immersive graphics again with options to select but there's a lot more smart behind the scenes of tracking things and actors voices etc etc so pretty similar to some of those games we saw in the past but souped up and generally mobile experiences Inkle Studios is the example of another company that makes this form of game 80 days is probably the most popular and most well known it has been running for a few years now. As you can see from the screen grab, it's again, you have images, you have audio, you have a menu where you select the options. There's resources that are tracked by the app, etc., etc. Most interestingly, they have actually open sourced and released the tools they use for creating some elements of their games. And I will cover that in the next section. Perhaps when most people hear the term interactive fiction, they think of games like Depression Quest, which is built in something called Twine. These games are much heavier on text and narrative and telling a story, generally fairly personal stories or stories that don't really get told in other more mainstream games and are more about the writing than the interactivity and the visuals, etc., etc., Depression Quest is sort of famous for other reasons as well, which I won't go into here. But just to illustrate that there are some interactive fiction games that have broken into the mainstream for various reasons, although the genre itself is much more of a niche subgenre, but a very big one, especially on platforms like Itch. And I will look at Twine, which is the tool used to create many of these again in the next section. A little bit different, I've included AI Dungeon here. This has been around for the past few years. It's actually something of a hark back to the old text-based computer games I mentioned earlier, but it uses GPT-3, the infamous machine language model to process the text. And I have actually done a video on it a few years ago now, and it gets quite weird quite quickly, but it's interesting to see how you can take this older concept and combine it with modern techniques to get something different and broader and kind of open-ended, I suppose. You may remember from a few years ago on Netflix was Bandersnatch, an interactive movie. They're back. <laughs> but no rewinding or fast-forwarding this time. It's delivered over the web so you can have interactive elements this, I don't know how successful it really was, but it was an interesting experiment. I haven't seen many more, so I'm guessing it wasn't that successful. But it, again, brought the concepts of interactive fiction into the mainstream. 
And I also heard on Rumours Authority that the show's creator did actually use Twine to plot out the story in the first place. Not to make the TV show, of course, but to plot it. Code name Sickness and other things like it are audio interactive fiction. We now have a plethora of audio assistants uh, whose names I will not mention, but you know which I mean. And you can talk to the story and interact with it. And code name Cygnus is an example of a more independent one, but there's many others. And it's actually quite a natural way of doing things. Uh, I think sometimes the menu navigation can be a little bit tedious, but, uh, and some use voice actors, some use computer generated speech or a combination of the two. They can be quite immersive, like listening to a radio play that you control, kind of equivalent to Bandersnatch, but for audio. And in this section, and the one that probably interests me the most, and maybe some of you, I will look at some of the tools available for creating similar works and games to what I have just covered. These tend to come and go. Some have been around for a while. Some are created by small teams, some created by big teams, some open source, some active, etc., etc. So it may be that by the time you watch this, some have come and gone or changed significantly, but Here's what I found at point of creation. And this is Tuesday. It runs in the browser. We're on itch. Not a whole great deal when you first open it up. You can add blocks and you then add bits to the box, like a scene, a choice, a map, etc., etc. And we can pick the image. We can add music files, color, sizes, etc. We can then add more to that scene as well and then from the scene also add more <laughs> and then from the block add more blocks for example you can see there's quite a lot to it sometimes not entirely obvious where to start but there's a lot here if you can start to figure it out and the the way it looks is more visually is, is different from some of the other tools so you may prefer it in some ways. Artisty or articky, I'm not completely sure, draft. This is a little bit different. It's one designed for much larger games and often used by the people writing the story of those games to create that narrative arc that can then be taken into quote unquote proper development tools like Unity or Unreal. A lot of big game design studios have their own tools for this, but this is one that is available to all. Possibly one of the most well-known games it's been used for is Disco Elysium. And I will say it's a little hard to start with and a little hard to understand, but it does offer some quite compelling features like separating out the various entities of your story, the, the scenes, the players, the locations, the objects, etc., and seeing how they all interact together which traditionally I would personally use something like a mind mapping tool for, or I also use a tool called Aeon Timeline quite a lot that lets you do a little bit of this, but in a, in a more limited way. It is an expensive tool if you go sort of pro, but it does let you do quite a bit for free. So it's worth trying out. It's Windows only and a very, very overwhelming interface, but definitely worth checking out if you want to get into creating more complex games than just interactive fiction and stopping there. Ink, I mentioned this earlier, this is used by the team who made 80 Days to make their games. It uses a markup style of language. It's interesting, but sometimes limited in functionality for gameplay, as generally it's designed for you to then import the story into Unity, which you can do. If you don't do that, it runs as HTML. You can also add in custom JavaScript. And I quite like it, but it lacks some of the variable support that a tool like Twine, which I'll come to shortly, offers again, because largely they assume you will take it elsewhere to finish the game. And here you can see I've taken a story and imported into Unity and the kind of, of what you end up with in the interface. You basically end up with the text, the script, the inky script, and the interactive point that you would then tie into other elements in your game. So it's a way a story writer can deliver the story and the interaction points to a developer to then add to. In form, I mentioned this back at the beginning of the video, the tool that we talk about now was created in 2006, but it's based on work that predates that. 
It is a little different from some of the others in that it is based around this more traditional interactive fiction, or to be precise, the text-based computer games where people type responses instead of click them like you do in some of the other tools we looked at. This means that Inform is less designed as a programming tool and more of a more of a way of interacting with a language model. The games it creates can often be hard to play, as you can see from the example I'm going through here. It sometimes takes a little while to figure out what you're supposed to do, but it can lead to a more natural experience. And it's a tool I am definitely going to dig into more in a future video probably, because from initial experiments I couldn't quite figure out how I was supposed to write things. Um, and because it comes from this very different world from how I've generally created interactive fiction. But still, it looks very powerful. And again, it is currently free and open source. So it'd be a very cool tool to dig deeper into to create those different experiences. Finally, Twine. Twine has somewhat defined the modern indie world of interactive fiction. Much like Ink, you can start very simply with text and links and just jumping between passages but there's a lot of programming power lurking beneath the surface. Stories run as HTML and all the other related HTML technologies like CSS and JavaScript that you can then publish on your web page, publish to numerous sites, etc., etc. For now, I will stick to this very quick overview you can see me going through. I made some of the basis of this presentation in Twine. Uh, this, this video is based on a presentation I did at a conference and I used Twine to actually create the um, the presentation on screen and then live edited the final slides for the presentation. Twine is a visual electron based editor. So it's cross platform and it has its own markup languages. It supports different ones and they all have their own kind of uh, traits and attributes. It's basically a lightweight but fairly versatile programming language providing the features you'd probably want for a tool like that. So uh, forks, decision trees, variable support, uh, hiding and showing passages based on variables, this kind of thing. So you have created your wondrous work of interactive fiction. Now what? There's a bunch of places you can publish them. Um, two of the most popular well-known ones are ifdb.org, which is the interactive fiction database. It looks a bit like a website from about 15 years ago. But there's a lot there and there's a lot of discussion and a lot of sharing of pieces. So you can find a lot of inspiration there as well before you publish. Better known is Itch, but Itch is not just for interactive fiction. It's for all sorts of games. So you're also competing with a lot of other types of games from indie, you know, full-on, scroller, 3D shooter, computer games to physical games and then interactive fiction somewhere in that mix as well. But you can also monetize there and they have a, a game jams and a much more kind of modern gaming platform approach to the site and the service and their business. For tools like Inky and Twine especially, most of the time you're just creating HTML. So you can also just host them yourself on your, on your website. You might all be now asking, okay, this is all very interesting, but why, Chris? Why? It's a good question. Well... Wow. Here's some of the reasons I like to make interactive fiction. I get lots of ideas that I don't necessarily want to turn into a short story or a novel because I haven't really developed them enough. And so this means I can explore the ideas. I don't have to take something and take it to one conclusion like you do in a novel or a short story. With interactive fiction, I can take a nugget of a concept and take it in different ways and let the, the reader, I don't know what the right word is, create the story themselves to a point of course there are boundaries that i set and thus people get to experience the story in a different way of course another reason is just to learn these tools are quite useful especially if you're new to programming you can write and you can learn some of the basics of programming like logic and variables and then those concepts will help you learn other programming languages but in a in a vehicle you're learning this in a vehicle that makes more sense to you as a writer. So it's a good stepping stone to learning quote unquote proper programming as well. And of course, the real reason is, hey, it's fun, I think, isn't it? I don't know. <laughs> anyway, I hope you enjoyed this quick introduction to interactive fiction, the past, the present, and some of the ecosystem of tools.
As I said, I will be producing some follow-up videos going a bit deeper into some of the current generation of tools and maybe some other subjects. So watch out for those. If you enjoyed this, please subscribe, leave a comment, share. Tell me your works of interactive fiction. I would love to see and try some of those. And maybe I'll even do a live play of them on my Twitch channel. So thank you very much for joining me. Keep creating and keep experimenting.